Let us pray. Our Father, we're asking that you speak to our hearts once again this morning in Jesus' name. And we pray that your spirit will search out and bring back everyone that is lost from the fold in Jesus' name. We pray that as a Savior is searching and calling, every one of us will respond so that we'll be back in the fold under the care of the shepherd and the Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Today, I want to talk about what naturally ought to follow when you know about sin. That there is sin present in the world and also present in you. There is something you will want to do about it. And this is something that is very, very common in the revelation of Scripture. And that is the message of the word on repentance toward God. Today, as you have known about the presence of sin in the world, and you have known about the power of sin in the unbeliever, we need to know what God expects that should be done because of those things remaining in the heart. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Not believe first and then repent, but first repent, then believe. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20 and verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it's not having faith first, and then after that, repenting. In fact, Jesus preached repentance himself. John the Baptist emphasized repentance. And Jesus commanded his disciples, there is something they ought to do. And that is preaching repentance. And the early church obeyed that. And they preached what Christ expected ought to be preached. Today there are many preachers and many churches that do not emphasize repentance. It was the universal call of all the Old Testament prophets. And since God has commanded that all men everywhere should repent, and Christ has commanded that all preachers everywhere should preach repentance, it then becomes something necessary for us to look into the pages of Scripture this morning and look at what the Bible talks about repentance. When I talk about the reality of true repentance. The meaning. When it happens in your life, how do you know that you have really repented? How do you find out about the reality or the truth or the meaning of repentance in your life? Number two, and look at the records of true repentance. In the Bible, we have so many records of the people that came to God in true repentance. In fact, that's the only way you can come to God. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. And the only door of escape from eternal punishment, from eternal suffering, the only door of escape from eternal torment and eternal torture is repentance. And all the people that came to God in Bible days, they had to repent. So we have a lot of record. I'll be looking at that. Number three, I'll be looking at reference to false repentance. All over the Bible too, we see that there are references to the people that appeared to be repenting, but really their repentance was not genuine, not deep enough, not genuine enough to catch God's attention. And number four, look at the results of true repentance. Number one, the reality of true repentance. What does it mean when the Bible commands that we ought to repent? What does it mean when the preachers and the apostles all over the Bible days, they said there should be repentance? What does it mean when you hear today, repent ye and believe the gospel? Here is the reality. Here is the meaning. Look at Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28 and verse 29. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go Walk in my vineyard today. And he answered and said, I will not. 
but afterwards he repented and went. Here we have the description of the natural man. The natural man is full of sin, disobedience, obstinacy, self-will, stubbornness, and hard conscience. He's hard-hearted. And so God in heaven is pictured as this father that had created all human beings. And he said unto one, do this. And he said, I will not. But eventually he repented and he went. What then is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. You see that individual? He was going in the way of sin, in the way of rebellion, in the way of rejecting the commandment of God. But then he changed his mind. He repented. He turned around. And now he went the right direction. My friends, brothers and sisters, that is the meaning of repentance. Having a right about turn. A change of mind. A change of direction. A change of attitude. A change of heart. Walking in darkness before, but changing your mind. I now want to walk in the light. Living in sin before, but changing your mind and saying, I want to live in righteousness now. Facing the wrong direction that leads into hell fire before, but now repentance means that you have a change in roundabout turn, and you are now facing the right direction that leads into heaven. I want you to look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. And you will see that in the Bible, the word repentance is associated with the word returning or turning. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn. You see that? You cannot repent and remain rigid. You cannot repent and remain in the same mode of mind. You cannot repent and remain in the same sin you were committing before. You cannot repent and still be facing the same old direction you were facing before. Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. You bring all those abominations together, all those iniquities together, all those evil things together, and you turn away from them. It's a complete turning. It's not a partial, gradual, slow turning. It's a complete final and full turning away from anything that is evil. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 18. Reading verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his way, says the Lord God. But is there any remedy? Is there any way of escape? Is there any way we can escape the judgment of God? That same verse tells you, repent and turn. You see that? You cannot repent and remain the same old creature. You cannot repent and remain the same old sinner. You cannot repent and remain the same old adamant, rigid, stiff-necked, stubborn sinner. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So shall not iniquity be your ruin. Look at Jonah. Jonah Chapter 3, if you are a good student of the Bible, you've been reading the Bible, you'll find out that Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached the word unto them. What was he telling them? He had only one message for them. Forty days, Nineveh shall be destroyed, overthrown. But in that message, though one sentence, you have the basic gospel. One, Nineveh had sinned. Everyone in Nineveh, the king, the priests, the princes, the people, from the greatest to the lowest, all have sinned. Yet you have another message there, that God is concerned about sin, anywhere it is found in the world. And therefore he will judge sin. He will bring punishment upon sin. And Jonah said, because of the sins that everybody had committed, that God was bringing judgment upon them. But then, they realized that if they will do something about it, there may be a door of escape, a way to avoid the judgment of God. 
And that's what they did in Jonah chapter 3 verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. There is room for prayer. But not if you are not turning from your sin. See what they did. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Can you see the repentance we are talking about? It's a turning from evil. And in verse 10, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God changed his mind, repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. Maybe there is somebody over there that says, it doesn't say the people repented, it only said they turned. Verse 8, let them turn, everyone from his evil way. And then in verse 10, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. In the Old Testament, in Jonah chapter 3, it said they turned. They turned. And that's the important word, turning. But I want you to look at the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The Old Testament said they turned from their evil ways. The Old Testament said they turned their faces from all their abominations. The Old Testament said they turned everyone from the ways of their violence. And Jesus, in commenting about that and preaching about that, he said they repented. So what's repentance? Repentance is a turning of your face, a turning of your mind, a turning of your conscience, a turning of your will, a turning of your mind, a turning of your whole life away from everything that is evil. Remember, to repent means to turn, to change, to change the direction of your life. Repentance is a change of the mind, a change of the attitude, a change of direction in your thought, in your deed, and in your word. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7. Here is the commandment of the Lord for those who are still living in sin. Whether you have never been born again, or you were born again before, but then like the prodigal son, you are now far away from God, far away from home, far away from the fellowship of the people of God. Here is what the Bible tells you to do. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon the Bible emphasizes the decisive manifestation of repentance as a complete turning from all sins, all abominations, all evil plans, all idols, all sinful thoughts, once and for all. Not slowly, not gradually, not bit by bit. Once and for all, you turn away from everything that you were doing before. In fact, there is a complete change. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. You are turning away from something and you are turning to another thing. You are turning away from the dark personality and you are turning onto the bright personality to God divine. Number two, let's examine some records of true repentance. We need to do this because even though we have said according to the word of God, repentance is a turning. It's a turning that you feel. It's a turning that you experience. It's a turning that all the people around you will take notice of. It affects your mind. It affects your will. It affects your desires. It affects your emotions. It affects every part of you. There is nobody that will repent and say, Well, you know, I repented, I turned, I didn't even recognize I was turning. I didn't even recognize I was repenting. When you truly repent, it's something that affects you emotionally and your will and your intellect and your life entirely. Let's look at records of true repentance. Job. 
Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The man said, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of everything I have said. I'm ashamed of the position I have taken. I'm ashamed of all the actions of my hand. I look at myself within and without, and shame covers me. That's repentance, friends. I abhor myself. I detest myself. I loathe myself. And I just bend myself low in dust and ashes. I repent. I want you to look at second. Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7 from verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godless sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world walketh dead. Paul the Apostle told the Corinthians something bad had happened in their midst. And in 1 Corinthians, he wrote to them about it. He said, Why is it there is sin in your presence, there is sin in your midst, there is sin in the congregation? You are puffed up. You are proud of it. You are rejoicing. You never dealt with it. They became sorrowful and they turned. And they repented. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Before they didn't think much about that evil. But now when Paul the Apostle spoke to them, wrote to them, and preached to them, they started thinking, oh yes, this is bad. How could we be so blind? How could we have kept quiet? How could we have been so unaffected by sin, by evil, by immorality? They were sorrowful. Because of that sorrow, they repented, they turned. And they all turned their wheels against anything that will bring defilement. Anything that will bring evil. I want you to remind you of Peter when he sinned. And to, to make you understand, when you are turning, when you are changing, there is a sort of shame and sorrow on your heart. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse... 73. After a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Immediately the cock crew. Peter, oh yes, he had been with the Lord. Peter, he was more than his zonal leader. He was more than a coordinator. He was already an evangelist. Because they had been sent out two by two before this time to preach the word of God. Not only that, he had been privileged to go to the mountaintop and see Christ transfigured before him. Not only that, he saw Moses and he saw Elijah. A person like that now told a lie. And he cursed. And he swore concerning it. And eventually the cock crew. He was not going to repent. He was going to change his mind. What's that change of mind? Remember? He was facing this direction. Repentance means he's not going to face this direction. What does that mean? I have denied the Lord. I'm repenting. I will never deny him. After this time, imprisonment may come. I'm changing my mind. I will never be afraid. After this time, they may challenge me. It may not even be a maid that will challenge me. A man that will challenge me. It may be a governor that will challenge me. I will never deny the Lord again. But then the sorrow that he even did it. The shame that he even denied the Lord. Look at verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept. Bitterly, you cannot be repenting and laughing. Impossible. You cannot be repenting and then accommodating your sin. Impossible. 
you cannot be repenting and then just uh, patting your sin at the back. Impossible. You cannot be repenting and giving excuse for your sin. Impossible. If you are repenting at all, it's for shame and humility and sorrow. You abhor yourself. You hate yourself. You hate what you have done because you have done evil. You turn around. You change your mind. You change your will. You change even your company. And now you turn in the right direction. That's how we know genuine repentance. And then I want you to look at Ezekiel. Chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 14. And see what repentance implies. The record of genuine repentance. Ezekiel 33 verse 14. And again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin. Remember that's the word again. Turning. The turning of your will. The turning of your mind. The turning of your disposition. The turning of your desires. The redirection of your entire life in the right direction now. And it says, turn from his sin and do that which is lawful. If the wicked restore the pledge and give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That means repentance incorporates restitution. You can see in verse 14, it says, turn from your wicked way. Turn from your sin and begin to do that which is lawful and right. But then there is no full stop at the end of it. That turning will eventually lead you to even giving back all the things you have stolen. All the things that you have taken unlawfully. That's real repentance. I want to show you a practical example of that in Genesis chapter 20. And let's see repentance incorporating restitution. Genesis chapter 20 verses 7 and 8. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. If thou restore not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. This man had taken Abraham's wife. And as a result of taking the wife of Abraham, the Lord came to him and said, You are wrong. You are dead. You are in sin. You are no more innocent, can I tell you? Whenever you go into sin, you are no more innocent. You might have been innocent for 40 years, for 50 years. The moment sin enters into your life, you are no more innocent. You are no more righteous. You are no more holy. You are no more acceptable in the sight of God. And so God told the man, now you are wrong, now you are dead, you have been misled, you have gone astray. But then there is something you can do. You can return you can repent, you can restore. They all go together. You repent, that means you return, that means you restore. And then in verse 8, Therefore I be made cross early in the morning, and called all the servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were so afraid. He didn't joke with sin. He didn't say, well, it's not too serious. He made it serious because it was a serious matter. Do you know people that don't make their sin any serious? And they go about and say, what did I do after all? They I even do it? You see, they do not make sin as serious as sin ought to be. They just pet sin at the back. They joke about it, they laugh about it, they smile about it. They are easy going about it. And that's the wrong attitude. A person like that will never be able to repent if there is no change of attitude. Look at verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him. Sarah is why. That's repentance. When you restore that woman. When you give away all the things that you have taken. Imagine that child that has stolen meat. And is still chewing the meat and saying, Mommy, I repent. Mommy, I change, and he's still chewing and swallowing. That's no repentance. That's similar to the highway robber. That's similar to the thief that says, I'm sorry for stealing that car, and keeps on using the car. That's no repentance. 
that's similar to the polygamy saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know the truth in time. If I had known the truth, I wouldn't have married a second wife if I discovered this church in time. But you see, before I came, I married a second wife, a third wife, a fourth wife. I'm so sorry about it now. So sorry about it now. If I'd known, I will not have done it. And he keeps on going to bed with that second wife. That's no repentance. It's like the fornicator that comes to the church and hears the word of God. Oh, I'm so sorry about my fornication. And then he continues after the service giving gifts or receiving gifts from the same partner. That's no repentance. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 3. Verse 8. If there is repentance, let's see the fruit. Matthew chapter 3 verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits, plural, fruits, meat suitable for repentance. That is, if you are repenting, oh, there will be prayer in your life. You will be so sorry you offended the Lord. You will be weeping because you offended the Lord. Sorrow will grip your heart and there will be a turning, there will be a change, there will be a desire for new life. And then I want you to look at Second Corinthians again, chapter 7. Second Corinthians, chapter 7. I read verses 9 and 10 before. Now let's look at verse 10 and verse 11. For godless sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. That is the salvation you will never regret. The salvation that will be your bona fide property all through your life as long as you are following the Lord. It's godless sorrow that walketh repentance leading to that salvation. And then it says in verse 11, For behold, they sell the same thing. This repentance we're talking about, that ye sorrowed after a godless thought. Ye, what clearing of yourself. Ye, what indignation. Ye, what fear. Ye, what vehement desire. Ye, what zeal. Ye, what revenge. All in all things, you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Let me just talk to you about that verse. Immediately, a person truly repents. Then the Bible says, yea, what carefulness. He's not very careful. That's the pit in which I fell before. He runs away from that direction. That's the nightclub that made me fall into sin. He runs away from that sin. Carefulness, carefulness in your life. This is the type of conversation, man asking unnecessary questions from woman that is personal, that is private, that relates to the body of that woman. That's the type of thing that got me to trouble before, carefulness. And then, that's the type of friend that got me to sin before, carefulness. That's the type of deal, business deal, that made me to backslide, carefulness. That's the evidence of repentance. But the person that says, you know, I've repented, never care, is never careful. It's never watchful. That one has not repented. And then it says, what clearing of yourself. Clearing of yourself. All the time you make sure now I'll be clear of this matter. You see that rebellion has started somewhere again. Now I've repented. You clear yourself. You avoid anything that will get you into trouble again. What indignation. Oh, that is indignation. Anger against sin. Immediately you catch, you catch the sight of a sin coming. You have indignation because that sin puts your back to the wall before. That sin caused you sorrow before. That sin caused you punishment before. That sin made your name to get out of the book of life before. That sin brought shame upon your life before. Anytime that sin is coming now, you fear it, you are angry against it, you hate it. What indignation it wrought in you and what fear. What fear? He that thinketh is standard, let him take it lest he fall. If I'm not careful, I will fall again. If I'm not careful, I will fall again. If I do not avoid that, I will run into that same mess again. Fear. But you know the people that walk so easily about? They sin before they got into trouble. Then, even now, they still they are at ease. They do not think about it. There is no carefulness. There is no zeal. There is no indignation. There is no hatred for the sins that got them into trouble before. It says, what revenge? It means all the time that I was in sin. I didn't have joy. I didn't have peace. I couldn't even serve my God. If I came to church and the read Bible, it was all darkness to me. Because I was confused in my mind and the devil was having all my time. Now I'm going to revenge on the devil. 
I'm going to serve him in a double manner. But you know there are people there in the church. They were disciplined for committing sin, for living in sin. A good church has to do that. The moment a church will keep quiet about anybody sinning, that means that church is not good anymore. That's not a Bible church anymore. But then after the discipline, maybe they are now told, now you're all right. You can come back. Now you have repented. That's what we thought. And after that, bringing back, no zeal. We'll just be at ease. Sometimes we'll not even come to Bible study. We made a mistake. That man did not repent. That woman did not repent. When you truly repent, you revenge on the devil. You say, this is what I should have been doing for the Lord. This is what I should have been for the Lord. This is who I should have been going for the Lord. I should be on the top of the mountain now. Why it not for that sin that brought me to the valley? Now that I come back to the Lord, I'm going to revenge on the devil and serve the Lord with a double zeal, with double energy. But you know, when somebody says he repents, when somebody says he's giving his life back to the Lord again, and you don't find that zeal, that carefulness, that clearing of yourself, that indignation and anger and hatred for sin, you do not have that revenge against the devil. That person has not truly repented. And then when you repent, you have acknowledgement of the truth. The truth you rejected before. The truth you spawned before. You now accept it. You say, yes, I appreciate that truth. But let me now make some reference to false repentance. I've shown you the record of true repentance, but in the Bible, there have been references to false repentance. And in fact, examples abound of those that show only a false sense of repentance. They make confessions every Sunday. They turn the church to a Protestant Orthodox church where they do not know about salvation. They come in here every time you make an altar call and you say, now if you want to repent, on Thursday, they raise up their hands, they come forward. The following Thursday, they raise up their hands, they come forward. When they come on Sunday, they are making another confession again. That's no repentance. That person is not serious. Heaven doesn't count that person as a person that wants to get to heaven. The person that is always confessing, never forsaking. Always confessing, never forsaking. Always holding that sin. Cherishing that sin, loving that sin, practicing that sin, never throwing the sin away. That man has never repented. There are some that pray for forgiveness every morning. Others do it every meeting day. Oh God, forgive me. Some will even weep for their sins. But that's no repentance. If you have not turned your mind, it is superficial. It's a counterfeit experience. And it is false. And because it is superficial and false, God cannot forgive. Can I show you some examples of false repentance? Look at Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. From verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. Oh, you will think that is repentance. That man has changed. That man is now making a public confession. I have sinned. This time now, I didn't see it before. Now I see it. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people were wicked. Look at verse 28. Entreat the Lord for me, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail. And I will let you go. And ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord. And then in verse 3, And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased. And the rain was not poured upon the earth when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were seized. He sinned yet more and hardened his heart. He and his servants, he confessed, I have sinned, I'm wicked, my people are wicked. Because of the punishment, because of the thunder, because of the hail, eventually when prayer was made and Moses by authority stopped that sin, he sinned yet more. 
Have you seen people that will go into adultery and fornication? When they are caught, oh, they tremble, oh, they shake, and they cry, and they weep, and they are sorrowful, and they say, well, I have sinned, I have sinned, I will never do that anymore. And eventually when they feel relieved of the shame, of the public knowledge of that thing, they go right back into the same thing. They sin yet more. Confession without change of heart. Confession without change of attitude. Confession without change of direction. That is no repentance at all. Let me show you another thing. Confession without obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, from verse 41. Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go, we will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had gathered every man his weapon of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you. Let's keep the smithing before your enemies. So I spake unto you. And ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously up into the hill. Look at these people in verse 41. They said, Moses, we are sinned. We're so sorry about it. We have done something that is not right. Many times that is what some people will look at. And they will say, after all, what do they want the man to do again? The man has repented. Didn't we hear him when he said, I am sorry? But you don't understand the hearts of men. You don't understand the disposition of sinning men and sinning women. They say they have sinned, but they continue in disobedience. They continue in rebellion. And when they came to Moses and they said, we have sinned. We have done something that is not right. Moses said, that's all right, let me hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, tell them to stay. Now they cannot work for God. Now they cannot fight the battle of the Lord. Now they cannot go, not go for war. And they said, uh-uh, that we will not accept. We are going to work for God. We are going to go up the mountain top. We are going to fight. But God said, you, you are confessing your sin just now. God said that you are not ready yet to go up and fight. They said, uh-huh, that we are not going to obey. We are going to run up and fight. And the Bible says, they, re they rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. That's no repentance. There are people that will make confession. And they do that in many, many churches every Sunday. We have done what we shouldn't have done. Then stop doing it. We have not done what we should have done. Then start doing it. But... They don't stop doing wrong. They don't start doing right. Every time they come, they make confession. People like that here too. They make confessions without any mind and any heart to want to obey the Lord. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm talking about false repentance. The people that do not genuinely repent. And you see that by all these references we're reading. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. You see confession in all these references I'm reading to you. That somebody says I have sinned doesn't mean he's repenting. If you do not turn, if you do not change, if you do not remove yourself and your attitude and your desire and your interest from the place of sin, if you do not have that change, you have not repented. Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and thy word. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin. Turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king. Verse 28. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has thrown the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also, the strength of Israel will not lie, nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, that's all I have seen. Yet, honor me now. Yes, I know I'm wrong. Yes, I know I've sinned. Yes, I know I've done evil. But won't you just appreciate me before the public? Won't you just show me that you honor me before the public? You know that problem? A person that has sinned, he knows he has sinned, but he's saying, if I confess, 
If I pray, especially if I pray aloud, if I seek the face of the Lord wholeheartedly from the depths of my heart, all these people will not honor me anymore. Looking for the honor of men, they lose true repentance. And it says in that verse 30, I have seen yet honor me now. I pray thee before the elders of my people and before Israel and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. A sinner will sin in heart, sin in hand, sin in the mind, still wanting honor and still wanting praise. They, they do not count the favor of God very important. They do not count the forgiveness of God very important. All they want is the praise of men and the honor from men. Those people cannot genuinely repent. That's false repentance. Let's see another one. Confession without change of life, change of plan, change of purpose, change of action. You see, when you really repent, a change will come in your life. Your total life will change. Your disposition will change. Your mind will change. Your language will change. Everything about you will change. That's what we call repentance. But look at this man. He still saw in um, chapter 24 of First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 24, verses 16 and 17. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Oh, look at the man. He is now repenting. He is now changing. Look at this man. He is crying and weeping publicly. That's what some people look at and they say, Oh, I pity that man. His heart is broken. His mind is tender. Now that man has totally changed. That man will never touch sin anymore. The man saw slanky and tall and fiery and a warrior. He began to weep even publicly. Look at verse 17. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. As the man changed, Look at chapter 26 and verse 2. Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of sea, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of sea. That's exactly what he cried about before. Doing the same thing again. Still chasing that man, lying against that man, slandering that man, persecuting that man, wanting to kill that man. And yet he cried before. And yet, he confessed before, there are people like that. They cry, they weep, they look as if they are tender, and yet, they are not repenting, they are not changing. They don't change the plans of their lives. They do not change the purpose of their lives. They do not change the directions in which they are moving. They commit that immorality over and over and over and over again. When they are caught, they will cry. They might even beat themselves on the chest and say, I will never do this thing anymore. But there's no repentance, only regret that they are being caught. They go back right into that thing. Or they have hatred, animosity, and bitterness in them. Then they come before the Lord when they hear the message. They say, Lord, I'm repenting, I'm changing, I've sinned. And the very next week, they have bitterness in their hearts again. Let me tell you this. If there's still bitterness in your heart, and jealousy in your heart. You see the problem of Saul. He was having jealousy and envy against David. David has taken my position. David is now made the king. I know David is going to reign. And Jonathan, my son, will not get to the throne. Because of that, I will kill him. And because of that envy and jealousy, because of that bitterness and hatred, whatever repentance they said they had was totally false. It was a counterfeit. It was superficial. Maybe yours is like that. Look at the New Testament in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 24. Acts 24, 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a joy, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Felix called for the greatest of all preachers and apostles. And he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. He wanted to hear about faith in Christ. Remember, you cannot talk about faith in Christ without repentance toward God. Without a change of mind. Without a change of direction. Verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled. He was shaking. 
he was moved. He trembled on his, on his seat. And he answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the opener and communed with him. He was looking for bride. When he heard the word of God, he trembled. He shook. That word of God convicted him and shook him. And yet because of his desire for money, because of the covetousness, he couldn't really repent. And there are people that may tremble at the word of God. But then immediately after the message, they do not pray in the message. Drive in the message. Until the word of God, until the hand of God will touch them and totally remove all the sins of their lives, they go back into the world that is the same as ever. Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, springing up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have been inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He wept, but then he still retained bitterness and hatred against Jacob. He said in his heart that the time of mourning for my father Isaac is near and I will kill Jacob, my brother. And because of that bitterness in the heart, the crying did not mean repentance. The weeping did not mean repentance. When you have bitterness in your heart, hatred in your heart, against the person that reported you, you have committed adultery, somebody must report it. It may be the person you committed the sin with that reported it. Then you cried, but you have bitterness against that person that reported you. You will never be forgiven because of that bitterness. You are like Esau. Or it may be a zonal leader or coordinator, very, very young, that challenged you and said, this is a sin. That's what you must do in the church. You are bitter, you have hatred, you have bitterness in your heart. Because of the people that challenge you, you will never be forgiven because you cannot repent in that condition of heart. If you are going to repent... You must leave all that bitterness of Esau in your heart. Push it aside. All the things that you are grumbling and complaining about, all those things are not important. What is important is come back to the Lord. Remove the bitterness, remove the hatred, remove the envy, remove the jealousy, and say, Lord, I am the one that falls. I am the one that has sinned. I am the one that has closed the gate of heaven against myself. I want to see your face on the last day. I am repenting. It may be your wife that reported you that you are not living right. And then you have bitterness against your wife. You'll never get salvation. You'll never get restoration. As long as that bitterness against your wife is there. It may be your husband that reported you to the uh, coordinator or the sooner leader. Saying that my wife is not living right. She's not supposed to be a worker. And eventually we discover you are living in sin. You're stealing. Or you're fighting. Or you're quarreling. And you have bitterness against your husband. Because he is the one that reported you. That's why how the church found you out. And you are praying, oh God, forgive me. God will never forgive because you are not repenting. If the bitterness is there, if the anger is there, if the indignation is there against your husband, against your wife, against your friends, against the people that made the church to detect you, you will never be able to get uh, forgiveness and salvation from the Lord. How do you now get the salvation? Well, turn around. Have a change of life. And come back to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I've done evil in your sight. What will be the result of true repentance? A lot of things. Number one, there will be forgiveness. The Lord will abundantly pardon. If we confess our sins, He's just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will forgive them and heal their land. Number two, there will be removal and remission of sin. Blotting out your transgression. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And then number three, there will be the cancellation 
of the penalty and punishment that has, has been awaiting you. Do you remember the case of Nineveh again? They turned from their wicked way. They turned from the violence in their hands. They turned from all the abominations they have been committing. And the Lord changed his mind. Punishment did not come again. Number four, there will be a reconciliation with the Father. I will arise and go. And say unto my Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no more worthy to be called your child. Just make me one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came and the father saw him afar off and he ran after him. He ran to meet him and embraced him and closed him. And he began to rejoice because this my son was lost. Now he's found. He was dead. Now he's alive. Number five, there will be joy in heaven. There is joy in heaven before the angels of God over one sinner that repented. What's the Lord telling you today? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 30. And in times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. If you're still living in sin, the Lord is calling you, is calling all men everywhere to repent. If you are backsliding, the Lord is calling you. He's calling all men everywhere to repent. If you are not totally backsliding, but you know that in your own life, there are things that the Lord will not appreciate. The Lord is calling all men everywhere to repent. If you have genuine repentance, the Lord will forgive you. Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. Why do you want to die? Why do you want to perish? Don't you know at the end of the life of sin, there is punishment, eternal torment, hell, fire. But today, if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, the Lord is merciful. He has grace, He has love, He has mercy. He will forgive. I want you to rise up on your feet and talk to the Lord in prayer. This is not a day to pretend. This is not a day to deceive yourself. This is a time to really come before the Lord. And you don't mind, there are people around you. You just open your heart to the Lord and pray. Don't be like Saul. Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't be hardened. The Lord has commanded that preachers should preach repentance. I have obeyed the Lord. I preach repentance unto you. The Lord has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now you obey the Lord and repent if you are still in sin. Sin will not profit you to damn your soul, ruin you, destroy you in the eternal lake of fire. Life is short. Life is short. Life is short. Repent. That's the door of escape from the judgment of God. To repent means to turn, to change. Not just to make confession. Not just to cry. Not just to be sorrowful. But to have a change. Do not be counterfeit. With superficial repentance. Drop those boyfriends. Drop those girlfriends. Drop those evil things. Yield your life completely to the Lord. Say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. If the word of God has pricked your heart, caught your heart, do not have bitterness and hatred. Hatred will close the door of heaven against you. Bitterness against the people that made your sin to be discovered. That will close the door of mercy against you. Repent. Call upon the Lord. Today is not a day of pretense. Be sincere. Be open to the Lord. The Lord is calling you. because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because
because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out of the room. I just came up for all this tradition. I just blessed you with the